Good evening, welcome to The Fix. My name's Aaron Bastani. I'm joined as is, it's not really that frequent anymore. We don't see that much of I don't other. like you anymore. Ash Sarko, the one and only <laughs> at IOC's. Uh, we managed to prize Ash away from her numerous speaking engagements. You're always like busy these days. because I don't have Tinder fam. I've just got to say uh. yes to telly. So we'll be bringing you the biggest stories over the course of the last seven days uh, this evening. We'll be picking a couple of each. And then later on, I shall be talking to Matt Myers about his new book. What's it called? Student Revolt, Voices of the Austerity Generation. Out now on Pluto Press from all quality book retailers. Can't wait. That's going to be very good. <laughs> but first, we're going to talk about a few of, like I said, the biggest stories of the last week. Ash, you're going to kick us off. So the really big news, which just broke a few hours ago, I'm pregnant. Ah. <laughs> No, just, Congratulations. Uh, no, I just ate a ton of noodles. Play in. Um, the big news is, of course, that sentient glacier mint. David Davis has just announced that when there is a finalised Brexit deal on the table, it will, it will have to be enacted by an act of parliament. So that means that MPs can vote on it. That means that they can table amendments and it will have to pass in both houses. Unsurprisingly, there is very little consensus on how this news is to be received. You've got Labour figures like Keir Starmer welcoming it as a concession to Labour's ongoing campaign for more parliamentary oversight of the Brexit process. You've got the kind of hardcore Remainers like Chukaramuna saying, well, look, this is just a kind of facsimile of a vote because if this deal gets voted down by Parliament, Britain will be exiting the EU on World Trade Organization terms. So it's kind of like saying, yeah, you can have a vote. There's only really one meaningful outcome because we've got a strap held to the dome of your economy. And there's also lots of talk about, well, will we actually exit on WTO terms or will there just be an extension of Article 50, an extended negotiating period? Will there be um, a campaign to perhaps withdraw Article 50? All these things are up in the air. And I was originally going to talk about the possibility of there being a second referendum today, what campaigning would look like, the dangers in trying to frame, I think, quite a nostalgic or reactive set of political demands. And obviously today's statement has shagged it entirely for me. Um, however, I think for all the speculation of what's going to happen in 2019, I feel that establishment media coverage has fallen quite short. And what it's done is fall into the old trap of perceiving politics as just a series of set pieces of kind of manoeuvring and skullduggery and one camp trying to take the wind out of the sails of another. But don't you think David Davis has played a blinder? Because it does seem to me that the Tories had their back against the wall on this. And because we have the Fixed Term Parliament Act, if Labour vote this down or if the opposition vote it down, they're still in government and obviously things will get terrible pretty damn quickly and they can then put that at the door of the Labour Party, the Lib Dems, the SNP. So this seems like a pretty clever move by the Tories, huh? And I'm, I'm in agreement there and I think that this comes down to the heart of the matter is that there's actually a real difference between um, campaigning for more parliamentary oversight and campaigning for effective <clears throat> popular accountability. Because what we've seen since the June election, whether it's been with the raid on pensions funds or whether it's been with the universal credit rollout, is that there is very little agreement on what should be voted on and also what an outcome of a government defeat in terms of votes means, right? No one knows what's going on. So going hand in hand with the kind of, you know, um, zombie atrophying neoliberalism that we're all existing under, there's also a kind of zombie parliamentarianism. And I think that the challenge that Corbyn's Labour Party now has to meet is to get a bit braver. Because I think one of the great successes of the election campaign was to revive politics itself. The idea that what's up for grabs isn't just um, disaffected consent, Right. But you present a policy platform that you can agree with, you can disagree with, you can engage with. But there's something substantive that's there. The two places where they haven't done that are very closely related. It's with Brexit and it's with immigration policy. And I think now Corbyn's team has to get a bit braver. They can't rely on this kind of Schrodinger's Brexit and they kind of have to present a much more 
a robust platform than just laying out a vision of a kind of socialist utopianism. So what they need to do is spell out what will it mean if the government collapses in six months, 12 months, 24 months, right? At what stage of Brexit negotiations? What difference does it make for them to inherit a WTO Brexit as opposed to a kind of high access, low control one? And I think that that's a really good thing. It's not messageable. It's messy. It's nuanced. But trust in the electorate with these issues and this kind of decision making, that's what democratic renewal looks like. And I think that's what we should all be agitating for. Well, from one political dinosaur, David Davis, to another, Tony Blair made one of his now frequent incursions into the popular conversation, one of his tri-monthly, bi-monthly brain farts. <laughs> he went on a multimedia assault uh, over the last few days. I think on Friday, he went on the Today programme with Nick Robinson. He did an interview with BuzzFeed, Jim Waterson. And then on Sunday, he spoke to Sophie Ridge. Uh, we're going to start with the interview he gave to BuzzFeed. Very funny. And it started with a, a bit of conversation about centrist stars. Let me get this quote up. He said, um, I think that's a term invented by people who regard centrism as the status quo place. If you define centrism as splitting the difference between right and left, then I'm not a centrist. I'm not interested in that. I define centrism as the place where you want solutions that are radical but still realistic and non-ideological because they're practical. Ash, what the fuck does that mean? Well, I don't think that Tony Blair's a centrist dad either. Right, why's that? Because my dad left. <laughs> right. But can you, can you translate this for me or...? I mean, tell you what, why don't you give me your gloss on it? Because right. I think what he's trying to do is claw back that neoliberal moment where right. ideology can present itself as pragmatism, which is the most ideological thing of all, right? Exactly. And also, look, centrism, the clue's in the name. Tony, you've got right, <laughs> you've got left, and then you have a politics which is purely relational on these two peripheries, and it calls itself the centre. The clue, like I say, is in the name. Um, and yes, the idea that... A practical politics cannot be coterminous with an ideologically driven or values driven politics is, is ridiculous. Now, sometimes values and what has to be done come into conflict. That's the nature of politics. But I'm ideologically committed to reducing carbon dioxide emissions. And if we don't do that, guess what? Half the cities in the fucking world will be underwater in 50 years time. So it also turns out that it's practical as well. So it's a false binary, which I think, like you say, He's just going through the greatest hits of the last uh, couple of decades, and he's not been at the top of politics for 10 years. He's still talking unadulterated shit. Then there was the, um, the Today program interview, which he gave with Nick Robinson. He talked about two things there, which <clears throat> I'll briefly touch on. The first was that he said that uh, Labour should be 15 to 20 points ahead of the Tories. And, uh, I mean, okay. They were polling mid-20s in April. Latest poll had them at 43, the Tories on 40. And everyone laughed at Diane Abbott when she said that they were going to make up that shortfall. Everyone right. laughed at yeah. her. You can't keep on moving the fucking goalposts. They would win a significant majority if there was a general election today. And here are the facts. 1997, 2015, every single general election, Labour lose seats. When they won a general election for the last time in 2005, they won with 9.5 million votes. In June, they got 12.5 million votes. 2015 general election, they lost 50 seats in Scotland. It's very clear that Corbyn's Labour have turned a corner. Whatever your beliefs, there's a historic change, right? Something's been interrupted. And the thing that was interrupted was a flawed understanding of technocratic machine politics conjoined with neoliberal policies. And the reason why Ed Miliband didn't do the same thing, and by the way, the Tories in 2015 were just as messy just as fucking crap and useless. But that wasn't exposed because Ed Miliband didn't do what Jeremy Corbyn did, which was break with that form of technocratic politics and offer a different kind of policy platform. But finally, Tony Blair chatting shit about polling and about centrism is all kind of funny. But then there was the stuff he said about Saudi Arabia. So uh, we're just now going to cut to a particular part of that interview on the Today program with Nick Robinson, where he talked about how Saudi Arabia is now a beacon for human rights and freedom in the Middle East. Well, I think the way I look at the Middle East, and I spend an enormous amount of time there, is I don't think this really is about 
a proxy war. And I don't think it's, although there's elements of this, I don't think it's really about Shia versus Sunni or um, Iran versus Saudi. It's essentially a battle for the, the heart and soul of the region, in which on one side you have people who really want religiously tolerant societies and rule-based economies and those that don't. And the new leadership in Saudi Arabia, and particularly the, 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 the Crown Prince and the programme that he's putting forward, is a programme that is about modernising the country, its society, its economy. And they see the threat of Iran as a threat that's pushing extremism across the region and destabilising countries, whether it's Yemen or it's Lebanon or it's Iraq or it's Syria. Well, I, I mean, this is complete nonsense. It's kind of entertaining to hear him choke on the Orientalism. Yeah. Do you know what I mean? It's yeah, like yeah. He's, he's trying to speak from underwater. It's like Samuel Huntington's trying to escape uh, from his neck. Yeah. I mean, look, let me get something clear here. Cards on the table. I'm half Iranian. I am, no. not, I am not standing for Iran. I'm not saying Iran is this sick. And like, you know, it's a major regional power with its own interests. It's in Syria. It's doing things that nation states do, right? Which is advance the national interest which is also the interest of the ruling class. I'm under no illusions. But the truth is, in Iran, more women graduate than men. There are women in parliaments. Women can vote. They've been able to vote for decades. Saudi Arabia, women could vote for the very first time in 2015. Women ran, for the, by the way, nobody's, this is not for the executive or for a president. This is for councillors who really have no power, right? It's a, it's, a, it's a despotism. It's an absolute monarchy, right? Women could stand for, for, for public office. But because women are legally prohibited from te speaking to men who are not their relatives in Saudi Arabia, right? Women who are running for office could only address all women crowds, or if they were addressing all men crowds, they had to be behind a screen or a man would read their speech for them. This is the country which Tony Blair is saying, you know, is on a path to democracy and a rules-based economy. He basically means neoliberalism and human rights. Uh, and when you compare it to Iran in a number of ways, Iran is not a despotism, it's a polyarchy, you know, both formally and informally, it has a constitution. Uh, the two countries are incomparable. But what concerns me the most is that the average Brit will be listening to this and they'll be saying, well, Tony Blair is intervening because he's a former prime minister, you know, and fine. You know, he's a, a prime minister, has a, a role to play, you know, their views are important. Tony Blair was a lobbyist for the Saudis, uh, between 2010 and 2011, he was a lobbyist for a, a nationally owned oil company. He gave them access to politicians, Chinese politicians. This is on the books. Tony Blair Associates got, I think, in excess of £350,000. So he's a lobbyist for these guys. He's been a lobbyist in the past uh, for a number of other regimes we find quite problematic. He was the prime minister when Hong Kong was given back to China. Between 1997 and 2007, he was in the country five times. 2007, 2008, he then gives a speech in Hong Kong, uh, sorry, in China, he gets $200,000 for that speech. And since then, he's not criticised the regime once. So here's the thing. People talk about Brexit, they talk about Trump, they talk about bots on Twitter. We have a former prime minister who is a lobbyist for China and Saudi Arabia, who is then trying to set the terms of debate for British foreign policy and where British lives may be lost or where taxpayer money may be spent in regard to foreign policy decisions. So we don't need to worry about Twitter. We don't need to worry about Cambridge Analytica fixing Brexit when we have absolute clowns, fundamentally charlatans like Tony Blair, at the centre, at the forefront of our national conversation. He shouldn't be in the Labour Party, and fuck me, he shouldn't be on the television. He shouldn't be on the mortal coil, mate. I don't know why you're stopping there. But I do want to talk about one more thing, Go. if I can. Yeah. Because... One of the things that I've been really concerned by is that there seems to be a real rebirth and renewal of the platforming of trans-exclusionary radical feminists. And I feel that while we have been quite effectively demolishing their arguments about how trans women aren't women and how trans women present a danger to cisgender women everywhere, and I think that there's been a lot of really great and useful work done demolishing it, there's not been that much time spent on thinking about how and why um, this kind of revived platforming of these figures like Jermaine Greer or Julie Bindle is happening. Because and this was big over the weekend, and right? And this was really big it over the weekend. It was all over the papers. Because and... you had um, Janice Turner's uh, heinous article saying children sacrificed 
to appease the trans lobby, which is just classic scaremongering. Front page of the sun as well, no? Yep, front page of the sun uh, today, which was uh, the, dra the skirt on the drag queen goes swish, swish, swish. Terrible scanning, doesn't even go that well with wheels on the bus, but I digress. And I think that we can see a lot of parallels between this kind of uh, confected moral panic about, you know, trans people corrupting our children and taking over our schools. We can see a lot of parallels with the kind of Section 28 hysteria of the 1980s, where we can see a lot of parallels with a um, kind of homophobic authoritarian populism, which came to power, I think, with Thatcher. And I think because we can see those parallels, weirdly, this should give us a little bit of hope because that was a really effective political strategy when it was able to present itself as a counter hegemony. So the Thatcherite narrative went that I'm going to come and make schools teach common sense curriculum values again, like, you know, the three R's and no more hippie teachers promoting homosexuality. And people were able to look at it and go, yeah, that sounds about right. Whereas actually, that kind of orthodoxy is no longer a counter hegemony. It's just hegemony. And what's more, that is completely at odds with the general movement of pop culture. Now, I'm not saying that life is not made often intensely unbearable for in particular trans youth and trans people of colour in this country. Almost half of all trans youth in this country have attempted suicide. 84% have self-harmed, and those are deeply alarming statistics. However, the Kardashians are trans-inclusive now. Kanye West is trans-inclusive now. Pop culture is going in one direction, and it is in a more inclusive, empathetic, and accepting one. And that's not the mood of our popular press. So that should lead us on to our second question, which is how can these figures, like Julie Bindel, like, uh, what's her name? Birchill, right? Like Jermaine Greer, how can they find friends in the right-wing tabloid press? Because, let's be real, these were the feminists who were getting smeared as lesbian separatists, as bad mothers and all the rest of it in these very rags not that long ago. And I was giving it some thought, and I was thinking about the fact that trans-exclusionary radical feminists aren't radical at all, because what they've done is they've looked at the foundational feminist premise, which is that Gender is a set of social norms constructed to dominate women as a class and that women's emancipation is based on the deconstruction and the dismantling of these norms and gone, well, we can't take that too far. We will at some point rely on a bi biological essentialism. And what they've done is essentially respond to the death of modernity and the kind of utopian potentials of, you know, modernist meta-narratives and kind of accept the conditions of post-modernity, that real change isn't really possible and it's not desirable, which is the exact position of these right-wing tabloid rags. They don't want change. They don't want political participation. The reason why you're able to see this kind of dovetailing of ideologically divergent political interests is because they both want the same thing, which is stasis. So when people say that identity politics are splitting the left and it's going to interrupt a program of social and economic transformation, I kind of present this counterpoint, which is no, these things are deeply connected. Trans rights are human rights. They mm. are our rights. They are political rights. And us as cis people need to ride or die for mm. our trans siblings. And I think we need to get a lot better at rejecting the framing of mainstream debate and push it onto politically useful territory. Excellent. Well, we're going to go to a break now. I think we're going to show our fundraiser video. We really need to change No, we're, not. we're, we're not. We're not showing our fundraiser video. We're showing a video of John McDonnell at the UCL occupation <gasps> in 2010. My favourite guy. Uh, and after that, you'll be speaking to the one and only... Matt Myers. About his new book. Great. Looking forward to it. See you in a sec. Um, first of all, just, I'm Ray Soledad. I've been Soledad to Jeremy Corbyn MP as well. He's in a Palestinian visa at the moment. I just want to congratulate you on what you've done. I think it's brilliant. And it's happening all over the country. And the messages that are coming in from university and colleges right the way across the country is absolute solidarity. And I think whatever you're seeing on the TV or whatever, what's happening along Whitehall, what's the real world? In the real world, what's happening is large numbers of students are actually saying we've had enough and we're not willing to take it anymore. And it is about, it is about the basic freedom of education. We thought over generations, people like me would fought for the right of free education. And these bastards are going to take it off us. 
And what this is all about is making sure that they don't. And I think you're having the effect. You're having the effect. Whatever they say, whatever Craig says, and it's very difficult not to use physical force on Craig. I know, but I, I'm trying to restrain myself in the chamber. Um, whatever is said, you are having that effect. I've been in Downing Street today, down along Whitehall. Some of you may have been there, but at 11 o'clock, 12 o'clock, large numbers of young people turned up of all ages, school students as well as college students and university students. And it was a, a joyous, absolutely joyous atmosphere when they assembled and climbed up on the lines of Trafalgar Square, and there was enormous numbers. And they spontaneously then marched down Whitehall. And what then happened is the police set up a barrier at the bottom. I filmed some of it. There was a barrier set up, a, a police right way across the road, and they did initially did a police search, surge, knocking young people over and pressing them up against safety barriers. And I think I filmed some of it because I was worried. Actually, it was almost almost Hillsborough like you thought someone was going to get injured by trampling. And then they kettled it. They kettled people in, and then left a police van in the middle and left it alone. And it was almost an act of provocation of what was going on. And people literally in kettled in had no idea what to do, and all sorts of things were breaking out. People were asking to leave, and they refused to leave. Some of, uh, some of my friends and colleagues are in there, trapped in there as well, and have been there for four or five hours, not allowed to leave. And when we've raised it with the police, they've said, well, we're about to supply them with water. People just want to protest peacefully. And of course, some violence did break out, and it's unfortunate, but actually, some of the violence also came from the police themselves, and a large number of people have been hurt too. I think that's a disgrace all around. And now, the whole point of the protest is about the peaceful demonstration of our views of opposition. And the, the whole message is that God, and it's in our long history in this country. If governments won't listen and if politicians lie, there is no other way but to resort to the streets. There's no other way in which we can register our voice if Parliament's not listening. And that's what people have done. I just want to say, well done. You've restored my faith in this. The, the place that um, William Morris wanted to turn into a, a house, as you know, in use of nowhere, it was a storage for um, detritus. Anyway, I'll get back there. Well, we, we, put a, we put a early day motion down today, Jeremy and I, on the, on the agenda of Parliament. They're not allowed to debate early day motions at the moment, but we put it down anyway. Just as an expression of solidarity, congratulated people who have been demonstrating and occupying universities and colleges right the way across the country because it is in line with the tradition of peaceful protest in this country. When governments refuse to listen, people have to take power into their hands themselves. And that's what you're demonstrating. And what you're doing, it isn't just among students. You've given courage and determination to trade unionists who are now fighting for their jobs, but others that are campaigning for justice in their own fields. I think you've sparked off a new generation, of course, of protest in this country, but also a new belief that people can assert their rights when politicians ignore them. Solidarity, and thank you very much for what you're doing. So that was John McDonnell all the way back in 2010 addressing the UCL occupation. And I know that that's a kind of shaky and unfocused mobile phone video, but being a completely sentimental cornball, I thought we'd kick off with that because really if it wasn't for that wave of university occupations between 2010 and 2011, I don't think Navarra Media would exist. I would never have met Aaron Bastani or James Butler. I would probably be richer, happier, in a more secure form of employment. So you wrote a book. Um, thank you so much for joining us. It's a real pleasure to have you here. Well, thank you for having me. Um, so this book, Student Revolt, Voices of the Austerity Generation, I can't recommend it highly enough. And I'm not just like gassing you because you're in front of me, like if it was shit, I would probably say. But one of the things that felt like a real joy to read was these memories which had kind of gotten a bit fuzzy around the edges for me were just sort of called back with so much clarity and emotional texture and richness. And these voices of people who I love dearly or maybe there's some friendships which maybe slipped off, they were suddenly called back with um, this wonderful clarity and you could just kind of hear these voices ringing um, in your ear. So I guess 
my first question is just how did this book come together and what was that process like of gathering all this testimony? Well, it's an oral history. Mm -hmm. um, so I wanted to create a history of the movement told through the voices of the people who made it. Um, so I did about 60 interviews over a two-year period. And it was quite, a, quite an emotional, uh, really creative process uh, in which um, telling the historical story is no longer... You know, the historian's not in the archives, you're talking to real people with real their memories. And the movement, because it was defeated, left for many, I think, um, well, the experience of defeat was very difficult to deal with. And so coming five years after, seven years after, um, these interviews, um, I think, allowed uh, people to come to terms with the movement. And hopefully by constructing this historical story, future generations can learn from the experience of the movement. And I don't think the 2010 generation had a space in which they could argue um, out what happened in 2010. There was no space, there was no space to um, create a balance sheet of sorts. Um, and I hopefully this uh, historical story, this of the 20th century movement, this book, uh, is their collective um, property. I mean, I'm not asking you to give away the best bits for free, but what did happen in 2010? Why did the student movement fail to secure a victory? If you had to give the kind of, you know, elevator version of the summary. Why they lost? Well, I would say, well, government intransigence. And there's a wonderful George Osborne quote from the book, when she says that we expected this. We expected resistance against the first rounds of austerity. And if we don't defeat the students, then the whole of our austerity regime is going to be called into question. They saw this as a fundamental um, battle that they had to win. So the government um, wasn't prepared to let the, let the students um, get their way. The Liberal Democrats, many of whom, like Vince Cable, were never um, reconciled with the fees policy anyway, chose to side with the government. And it was faced with a student movement divided between official and unofficial movements, um, between an NUS that was focused on parliamentary action and winning over one or two Liberal Democrat MPs versus the movement in the streets, which was in no mood to make any deals with any politicians, uh, but felt betrayed totally by the political system. Um, also a student body that was actively demobilised. We hadn't had movements for decades, especially not as radical as the one that Milbank set off. Um, mixed, I think, with um, tactical mistakes and no space, political space anyway, to argue out possible um, tactical changes, um, mixed also with huge police repression, um, the police actively crushing uh, the movement in the streets and, the, and students being brought through the courts. Um, and I think we'll all remember Alfie Meadows, who was nearly killed by a police baton. So I think it's a mix of all these, all these, all these reasons. I mean, one of the things that I think you discuss quite well in the book is that there is a assumed antagonism towards hierarchy and hierarchical forms of organisation. And there's a great deal of disagreement in terms of the voices that you um, interview, in terms of should there have been more of an embrace of leadership. It's kind of funny that one of the results of 2010, 2011 is actually a, ref a revival of institutional forms of political organisation, i.e. the Labour Party. It's made a big comeback. So one is, do you think that this kind of return to um, institutional politics represents a failure of non-hierarchical organising? And two, do you think that Corbyn would be possible without that kind of mass mobilisation first in 2010, 2011? Well, I do think in 2010 there was this proliferation of non-hierarchical organising. Some um, of us are still repping hard for it, by the way. But I think it was this generalised, really generalisable um, experience, and it made sense to people at the time, because you had a political class, all of political parties seemed totally out of touch with where students were. Students in 2010 had put their faith in the Liberal Democrats, who had framed themselves as a party alternative to New Labour. They didn't vote for the Iraq War. They had promised free education. Students felt totally betrayed by the breaking of that promise. That really undergirds sort of the moral economy of the, of the student protests. But also you have the Labour Party who had commissioned the Brown Review, had brought in tuition fees twice, who had invaded Iraq, and you have a Conservative Party that students generally don't, don't support. When the Liberal Democrats betrayed the students, the bottom fell out of politics and they were in no mood to make any um, accord with these politicians um, who had sold their future down the drain. 
I think as the movements progressed and the social movements, it wasn't just uh, the Chinese movement that was interested in non-hierarchical organising. You had Occupy, you had UK Uncut, you had a number of different social movements in the, in the streets. Um, none of them seemed to break through. Uh, I don't think it's any surprise that people felt in 2015 that they had um, put all of this effort over the past five years to very little um, result. The Tory government that was coming in with a larger majority than the coalition. And I think people were desperate for change and that, I think, laid the basis for this shift in many people, this return to the institutions. And many of those 2010 generation have now found themselves in the Corbyn project. I don't think there's I think there is this narrative arc between the 2010 student movement and, and the present, but, but it's, I think in the movement's defeat that it created the conditions in which people have started to think, well, maybe Jeremy Corbyn, Jeremy Corbyn can break through where we couldn't. I mean, I don't know about nothing to show for it because I had six months of chest infections, mister, and that is something to show for, you know, occupying various cold floors in winter. Um, I mean, I've... I guess this isn't necessarily a question you can answer decisively, but maybe it's something that you can sort of tease out an answer from, is that in the book you talk about this kind of upsurge in insurrectionist energy, and I do want to show a video in, a, in just a second, um, but that actually coded within that was a kind of appeal to power, which is almost, look how angry we are, look how... Um, you know, look at what you've riled up, something has to change. And people weren't prepared for disappointment, right? Not just defeat, but actually uh, that demonstration of real politic and just how unaccountable their institutions are. Do you think that we have emerged from that tougher, smarter and more resilient or, inshallah, this won't happen, but should the Corbyn project fail, are we headed towards another similarly irreparable kind of political disappointment, only perhaps a lot more catastrophic in terms of the mood that might engender? Well, I think there's, there is that possibility. But I would say that the, the structural economic uh, drivers that created the conditions for the movement like 2010 are still there, are still present. Um, this generational cleavage, which is ripping open British politics, 2010 was simply the first, it was the market, it was a political touchstone um, that signified this new political subjectivity which um, was expressed in 2010 in the, when young people took to the streets and in 2017 when they took to the ballot box. Um, it's the experience of young people today um, living under austerity, living with futures which are looking like they're going to be far worse than their parents with paying almost half their rent on, uh, half their income on rent, um, with a job market in, with precarious work, um, huge student debts with 6% interest rates. This is creating the conditions um, for uh, social movements in the streets, but also uh, movements at the ballot box. And I think we need to continue the student movements um, going forward. We can't let up uh, the social movements in the streets if uh, Corbyn is going to uh, succeed. So I think there's got to be this uh, relationship between the two. I mean, just forward. before we wrap up, I do want to show this great clip, which you discuss in the book. Can we show it? We're from the slums of London, yeah? How do they, how do they expect us to pay 9000 for uni fees? You get me? And EMA, EMA with the only food keeping us in college, what's stopping us from doing drug deals on the streets anymore? Nothing. Because there's not just one 2010-2011 generation. There was kind of one surge of insurrectionist energy on the streets, and that was the students. But then the kind of coda to this, and it's kind of in conversation in the book, is the riots of mm. 2011. Do you think that that energy has been coordinated and appealed to in the same way by Corbyn's project as it has kind of courted uh, the remnants of that student movement or is that still something that's kind of pulsing and waiting to blow? Well, I think that the 2010-2011, that's very much a political conjuncture. Um, the 2010 student movement and the 2011 riots, I think the spirit of many um, of those involved, I mean, the spirit of both were very much... Um, uh, implicated in, in each other, this rebellion total against the system itself. No, politi no politicians represented the students, no politicians represented anyone in the streets in 2011. But I do think the current conjuncture is slightly different. Obviously there are multiple 2010s. There are the 2010s of the Russell Group University students who are occupying, there's, a Russell, there's the 2010 of those uh, people you saw in the, in the video. Um, 
also within the 2010 generation, there's multiple 2010s uh, going forward. There's those of radical so social media, um, people who've made careers in radical media. There's those 2010 people who've gone into the radical independence campaign, into the Corbyn campaign, into the Green Party, into UK Uncut. Um, they've taken their experiences forward. Um, I do f think that the 2010-2011 period is, I just get the sense that that was a very, very specific conjuncture coming out of the 20, uh, 2008 uh, financial crisis. It was a total rebellion against the system. And I, I do think the conditions are still there for some, some uh, explosion like that to emerge again. But I think we are in a new conjuncture now. I think the horizon has, has shifted on questions like free education, on questions like gentrification, on rent controls, on building new houses, on defending the welfare state. I think Corbyn has shifted the political debate. And I think those movements in 20, 2010, 2011, I think paved the way for, for, for that to occur. Um, so that's, I think, why we need to return to the experience of 2010, 2011. Because I think it really did lay the, lay, lay the basis for the changes we're currently seeing. I mean, I will really encourage people, cop this book. I'm not just saying that because a mate wrote it. It's actually really sick. And so because we love a good competition at Navara, I got my first que suggestion for a competition question rejected, which was guess Matt's star sign. So if you tweet at Navara Media with, um, oh, what was the question? Who admitted to spineless dithering over supporting the protest in 2010? If you tweet with your answer, one of you will win a copy of this excellent book. Um, I don't have one with me, so Matt won't sign it, but um, I'll just like write fuck you or something in it. So we'll post it to you. Uh, thank you so much for joining us. It's thank you. been a pleasure. Thanks for having me. All right, same time, same place next week. Bye.